and welcome back to the Purple Cloud podcast after quite a hiatus. I have started a master's degree which has consumed an enormous amount of my time so I have had to put the podcast aside for a while while I focus on my studies. The Purple Cloud Institute has also been busy behind the scenes. We've been organizing an online education platform for Chinese medicine and Taoism. So keep a lookout for that. It should be up and running in the next few months. Now, the following interview was not one conducted by myself, but by my friend Matthias Daly in Taiwan. And he contacted me and wanted to take advantage of a visiting guest, today's interviewee, Red Pine or Bill Porter. Now, for those of you who may not know who he is, he's quite a famous and distinguished translator of Buddhist and Taoist texts and actually wrote one of my favorite but an incredibly inspirational work to me personally as well, which was uh, Road to Heaven, Encounters with Chinese Hermits, which I read a long time ago, many, many years ago and was one of the inspirations for me to go to China and pursue my studies there. Uh, In the podcast, Matthias and Red Pine have a great conversation. They delve into the philosophy of uh, Bill's translation methodology and the history and the practice of Zen Buddhism. And they go into Bill's personal story in quite a lot of details and his practice as well. So it's... uh, Always interesting to see and hear how scholarship informs practice and vice versa. And they also talk about Bill's forthcoming work, which is uh, called Dancing with the Dead. And it's an anthology of Chinese poetry translations, which they discuss in great detail in the interview. So without further ado, let's get into it. Matthias. Um, this is Matthias Daly here doing a guest uh, interview for the Purple Cloud podcast, uh, filling in for Daniel Spiegelman. And it is my honor to be in Taipei today and have the renowned translator and writer Bill Porter, aka Red Pie, sitting here. It's an honor to be here, Matthias. Looking very comfortable. Um, and so, as I understand, you are currently in Taipei filming a documentary or you just finished filming? Yeah, we days. just finished uh, filming the Taiwan part. We've been, the filmmaker has already gotten a lot of footage from China mm-hmm. and, you know, interviewed me in my home and around town and mm-hmm. interviewed other people uh, in New York uh, and elsewhere and, okay. and my friends. So there was just this big gap mm-hmm. because I spent 20 years in Taiwan and mm. it was from the time I was... Uh, 28 till the time I was 48. Wow, okay. So that's sort of a formative time in most people's lives and was in mine. So we were just waiting for the door to open. Okay. And thank God it opened two weeks ago. And as soon as it did, we got tickets and came to see whether we could get some footage of of people and places associated with my time here. Okay. And so what's the title of the documentary? It's called Dancing with the Dead. Dancing with the Dead. It's taken from a a short article I did for Simmons College back in 2004. Mm -hmm. They had the first ever international conference on uh, uh, Chinese poetry. Okay. And they invited some poets from China and Taiwan. And they asked me, how how do you translate? Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it. Hmm. And I came up with this idea, Dancing with the Dead. Okay. Which kind of uh, sparks a question, I guess. It's just, I, I, I recall I've heard you say on more than one occasion to you uh, the work of translation or the art of translation, the process is, is even almost shamanic. It can be. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's obviously it depends on whether you're, you're, you're translating a manual, mm-hmm. you know, a, a TV guide, or, right. uh, whatever. Uh, Poetry is is a, a language form that is 
that barely surfaces in words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Words just bob up above the surface like a whale and then go back down. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the nature of, of poetry. You don't see much. Yeah. You see something and you wonder what's, what's under those words. And, and were you uh, interested in poetry, reading poetry or, or even writing it, involved in it before you came to Taiwan and before you began learning Chinese? Or was that something that developed as you learned the Chinese language? Well, I, I, I read some poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I once even took a class in it in college, and um, I, and I, I I ran into a few poets that I admired. Twentieth mm -hmm. century poets like Hart Crane is probably my my favorite. But um, anyway, so I had some you know mm -hmm. knowledge of, of of poetry, but I never thought much of it. And I certainly don't write, never have written poetry, and, oh, okay. and I'm I'm sure I'm certain I never will. Mm -hmm. But um, what I got involved in is first reading Chinese poetry, and then I was living in a monastery, Buddhist monastery in Taiwan, and mm -hmm. the, the, the abbot uh, happened to call me into his office one day and say, here, I just helped finance this, this book. Um, here's a copy. Maybe there's some English at the back, mm -hmm. and maybe you might like to translate some of these poems. Okay. I looked at the cover. It was the poetry of... Han Shan and Sherda, Cold Mountain and Pickup. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, I've, I, you know, I read Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. Yeah. And of course the book's dedicated to Han Shan. So mm -hmm. I said, wow, well, here are the poems. Yeah. So, uh, and he had pirated, the, the, whoever put the book together had pirated Burton Watson's uh, translations of one third of the poems. Okay, okay. So I took that back to my room and I said, here's the Chinese, here's some English of, of some of the poems. And wow, the style is so unique. And then later I found out Han Shan, or Cold Mountain, was one of the first poets who wrote in the vernacular. Oh, okay. Just okay. In the Tang Dynasty, he was rare. Mm -hmm. um, and so his poetry was very easy to read. I see, I see. And so that was the beginning of my fascination with Chinese poetry because um, it, um, it drew me in without any difficulty at the beginning, mm -hmm. Cold Mountain. And then I, you know, I also tried translating it, not really to translate it, but I, I sort of said to myself, look it, this is a great way to learn the language, mm -hmm. is trying to translate it. Okay, right. And so I just did that for a while. And, uh, and then I think I had translated about 50 of the poem, 300 poems. And that's shortly after that, I moved out of the monastery to this place called Bamboo Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, on the, above Yangming Shan, mm -hmm. living, and, and I lived there for fourteen years. But I kept I kept translating a few more of the poems, and then I finally had a collection of sixty or seventy, and I sent them to publishers like Shambhala, mm -hmm. Weatherhill, and Tuttle that published such things. Mm -hmm. and of course, none of them were interested. In, okay. And in truth, they were really bad translations. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was translating a martial arts text. Uh, an e Sing martial arts text for a friend from Australia. Okay. And he'd come up once a week and I'd go over the passages he wanted to understand. And he said, hey, Bill, you've got all these books by John Blofeld. Why don't you write him and ask him what to do now with your translation? Mm -hmm. So I did. So I wrote him and he wrote back and he said, send me 10, ten send me 10 of your translations. And I did. And a couple weeks later, I get them back and they're covered with notes. Okay. He said, send me 10 more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then 10 more, and then wow. 10 more, wow, wow. and then 10 more. And he encouraged me to translate all 300 of them. Okay. Um, but while I, while I was nearing the end of that, an American just knocked on my door one day and said, I hear you're translating Cold Mountain. Mm -hmm. Do you need a publisher? And he was from the area where I ended up living now called Port Townsend. So he was from, is that Copper Canyon Press? Or? Yeah, and okay. he says, I, I know the, the guy who runs Copper Canyon Press. And okay. so I sent them a, the manuscript and they loved it and published it. Okay. And so that hooked me into the idea of, of sharing mm -hmm. my work. Of course, the bad part of that is that you're stuck with really bad translations. Because for me, my translations are always better tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> and and so but once you once you get it published then I find it very difficult to read any any of the books I tra publish. All right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's how I started translating. Mm -hmm. But what happened in that process of doing Cold Mountain and then 
uh, while I was doing that, I had a King Dynasty woodblock edition of, of his poetry mm -hmm. that had another poet after his. Okay. And this is a, a monk named Stonehouse. Mm -hmm. And I liked his poetry even better. Mm -hmm. And so I translated all of his poetry too. And so suddenly I found myself just um, loving the experience of translation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't write poetry, but I love to translate it. Because mm -hmm. I, I love the experience of, mm. of uh, discovering where this, this poetry comes from. Uh, okay. And that's when I came up with this, this idea of dancing with the dead. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's as if I see a, beautiful, a woman dancing on the dance floor. And she says, Dan, it's a, such a beautiful dance. I want to be part of it. Mm. But I'm deaf. Mm -hmm. I don't hear the music. Yeah. She does. So I uh -huh. go on the dance floor and I try to accompany her. But I, I don't put my English feet on her Chinese feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that's what translation is, mm -hmm. being accurate, literal. Of course, you kill the dance. Mm. And you, you know, um, so you have to feel, be close, but can't be too far away, can't be too close. Mm. But you've got to be able to pick up the energy of this dance. Yeah. Um, and where is it coming from? And so for me, that was what drew me into not really being able to stop dancing. I love, I love that experience of, of going on the dance floor or on the page and seeing this, this, the, 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 uh, the traces of the dance mm -hmm. on the page and then trying to find out where are they coming from, how can I dance with that. Yeah. So I don't imitate the dance, I accompany it. And, and I'm, I'm very curious, I actually have quite a few questions out of that, what you just mentioned, but I'm very curious specifically to this dancing process. You, you noted that you had been in a Buddhist temple when you started uh, translating Cold Mountain's poems. And then you moved to a rural setting on, on Yangming Mountain, which for people who haven't been to Taipei is, you know, it's very close to the urban center, but you can feel quite removed from if you want even modernity, depending on how, how rustic you're living up there. Uh, and, and so I'm wondering to you, what was the setting? Because I, to this day, I know cultivators, uh, Buddhists and Taoists who also look at Han Shan and as this legitimate model, sort of iconoclastic, free mountain living uh, master. You know, some people sort of think of him as more of a Taoist or more of a more of a Chan master or a mix of the two. To you, was being in a temple setting and perhaps uh, I don't know what your your practice was if you had a, a meditation practice, and then living in rural uh, Yangming Mountain and even maybe later in you know Port Townsend is a really beautiful area. Um, has has there been an overlap for you with that? Because I mean, so much of Chinese poetry is it's you get these moments where the writer has clearly felt a, 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 a deep instance of tranquility or inspiration or connection with something that, 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 that the poet witnessed, encountered, and became one with in, in the natural world and in, in often in remove in seclusion, especially now that you're translating Tao Yuan Ming, that's something he's so famous for. Well, yeah, it's... Well, I, when I lived in the monastery, I lived a monastic life, you mm -hmm. know, and of course meditation was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But I've, and I've carried that, that on uh, outside of the monastery, mm -hmm. but you know, probably not three hours a day like I was in the monastery, but mm -hmm. probably an hour a day. Mm -hmm. So, but living in, in Juzuhu, Bamboo Lake, where, where I lived 14 years, it was a rural setting. There was uh, we, there was a bus that came up the mount, uh, mountain once in, about once an hour. Okay. So you, I could get down the mountain to teach English to make money mm -hmm. to support myself, and uh, but otherwise it was a very quiet setting. Um, very few visitors. Mm -hmm. um, somebody had to know you were there to find you. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, it just you know what I what I did is I just you. Know, and I think most practitioners do this. You may run into a a, a place where the, everybody has a, 
a set practice, mm -hmm. like a monastery, mm -hmm. organized practice. Mm -hmm. But once I moved out of the monastery, I was on my own. I put together my practice. Okay, yeah. Um, if you find out, you know, when, you, when do I like to meditate and then what else do I like to do? Mm -hmm. Well, so I would practice calligraphy sometimes um, and then and keep and started this translation practice. Not that I knew it was going to go anywhere, mm, mm. but it's just I liked the experience of of just doing it. Yeah, yeah. and just um, when I left America, I left America, and when I came here, I, I had to put together a whole new life, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing about being a foreigner. Yeah, you know, you you have the opportunity to remake your life. Yes, yes. And so I did, mm -hmm. and uh, so I put together a, a life where I, I sat around a lot and drank tea, meditated, and uh, the place where I, I was living up in Bamboo Lake is, is a beautiful place. You can take walks, and um, I walked in the valley every day, and mm. there's just, the only people I would see were farmers. Mm -hmm. um, they, they grow uh, mostly cabbages and calla lilies. Mm -hmm. So that's that sort of all was conducive to me being able to put together a, a life where things didn't clash. Right, right. And they all sort of supported each other. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, this this kind of life can work. And mm -hmm. it did. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, translation just became part of it without me ever intending for it to, to become part of. Mm. Um, did you, um, I, I've noticed in in Zen Baggage, and I think maybe at the beginning of Road to Heaven, you quoted uh, Gary Snyder po poems, mm -hmm. and I, he also translated some of Cold Mountain's yes, work, yes, right? Yes, yeah, I think he was the first person who, who or wait, no, I think, I think uh, Arthur Whaley oh, tra wow. okay. translated a, also a couple dozen, mm -hmm. and then Gary also translated a couple dozen, mm. um, because his professor at, at Berkeley uh, uh, turned him on to uh, Said, I think you're the kind of person who's going to appreciate Han Shan. And oh, so, okay. So yeah, Gary and, and both Arthur, Arthur Whaley had published uh, some of his poems. And, are, and do you personally know Gary Snyder? Or? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, it was Gary when back. At one point, I went back to America after I'd been here for some years. I went back for one one year. Uh, I took. Our, I got married. And we had two children. I took our, my my four year old son to. My daughter hadn't been married, uh, mm -hmm. been been born then, um, to America. This this artist, this sculptor, invited me to come live on on, on Guaymas Island, mm -hmm. uh, near Anacortes, and not far from Seattle, and and had a cabin where I could live. So I I lived there with my son for a year. Oh wow! Okay. On on on, on Gua Guaymas Island, and uh, um, just just took a took a break even from from Taiwan, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and continued to, to to translate. In fact, I, the reason I was able to do it is I, I got a, a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to translate a second volume of, of Stonehouse. So I, uh, that was sort of like when I realized that, that this translation was going to be more than just a, a whim or just mm -hmm. a, a short-term thing. Just um, the, When I was coming back to America, back to Taiwan, Gary heard that I was in the country. Um, from his, uh, and he invited me to t talk to his students at at Davis University of California Davis, and after the class he says, "Bill, you need a publisher. Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce you to mine." Mm -hmm. And so then he introduced me to Jack Shoemaker, okay. who had a press called North Point. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and and he published my my Bodhidharma book, mm -hmm. and he was going to publish several others of mine, but then uh, the person financing North Point died, and Jack had to switch. Presses and, um, but anyway, Gary and I became friends and um, invited me several times to stay at his place. In fact, when I came back finally to America in '93 to find a place to live, the first place I did was to go stay with Gary and his wife Carol Coda, mm -hmm. and uh, spent a few weeks there looking for property that you know houses I might buy. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, think about where Gary's living on the San Juan Ridge. It's it's sort of remote. Yeah, I've it, read about his yeah his it, home there. It's a uh, and I, I had two young children that were needing to go to school, and mm -hmm. so anyway, I drove up the coast and finally ended up back in Port Townsend, where Copper Canyon Press is located. Mm -hmm. And I'd met the people associated with that, 
uh, that press and another and another small press called Empty Bowl. And I liked the place, and so I said, okay, let's. And and it was a town, a small town, but you could, my kids could walk to school, mm -hmm. and I bought a house. So I never did live next to Gary or with Gary, other than those those brief brief times when uh, I was passing through or, or looking for property. But uh, uh, so so something I'm. And I don't know if this is kind of I'm I'm drawing together strings that don't necessarily exist, but something I mean I'm I've I've read uh, Gary Snyder's work and Jack Kerouac's as well, and in in some ways it, Jack Ker Kerouac was definitely not my introduction to the Dharma, uh, but I read Dharma Bums very early on when I was sort of wandering around in my early twenties and kind of had reached some kind of a point where I was, you know, like out of college and I had a pretty rough time in college. I managed to get kicked out for a while and wasn't really sure what the hell. I flunked out of three myself. Uh, yeah, well, I, I graduated. I, I didn't flunk out. I got kicked out for behavioral oh. um, misbehavior. Uh, and But it was just kind of like looking at adulthood. It was just like, well, what is this? It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't look fun. It doesn't. And it looks kind of like people kind of ossify and not necessarily in any kind of good way. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people at that age and going through that kind of um, process, it's easy in the English speaking world to come across Kerouac. And, and I had already encountered uh, meditation with Buddhism and Taoism in Chicago. Uh, but at that point, I was just kind of actually kind of rootless in New Zealand. Um, I, I'm also a Kiwi mother's from New Zealand. And uh, the Dharma bums made a really deep impression on me and uh, the character Jaffe Ryder based on Jack Snyder also really, for some reason, just shown out of that, out of that book. And, and um, so what I'm kind of thinking about is the way that obviously Kerouac uh, had not joined the rat race and has become even sort of a, a symbol for, for wandering and picking your own path and maybe, maybe ending up not meeting a great, a great end. I mean, he, he, I guess he pretty much drank himself to death, but he, He's a hero, I think, to a lot of people in a way. And, and I noticed, uh, you know, the, your Zen Baggage, your book about traveling around to the, the, the temples founded by the six, six early masters of Zen in China, ends with this really beautiful recollection where you're, I guess, just days away from moving to Taiwan for the first time. And you, I guess I'll just recount this because listeners haven't necessarily read your book. You know, you, you had, I, if I recall correctly, in a moment of needing to kill some time in the days before everybody could just uh, swipe through their cell phones endlessly to do that, you went and bought a small chess set and a travel chess set. You were going to play a game alone and a hobo came up and joined you and narrated this very moving story about being uh, bailing out of an airplane in World War II in the Philippines and being rescued by a tribe living in the forest and it seemed like um, he really became a part of that that tribe for six months uh, after they saved him but then he accidentally ended up running into the army again and is basically told fall in if you run back into the forest to your new your new family, well, he, you know, he knew he could get shot for desertion, and that the way the Zen baggage ends with that meditation and the 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 spirit. A lot of people of a lot of the early Americans who were really bringing Zen into poetry and into novels and memoirs of. I guess you call it dropping out in the most simple terms. And I wonder if you feel, because you speak so much in Zen Baggage when you look at the history of the founding of Zen communities and what really made Zen different from Buddhist forms that had existed unto then was this communal living where, you know, it'd be groups of 600, 1,000 monks farming, working together, creating their own, I, I guess we would call them communes really now. And you, you make a comment in your book that in many ways... Um, ironically, given how, how the temples were destroyed, but they were more communist than the communists themselves. And so I'm, I'm just, this long roundabout question is, I'm, I'm very curious to you, is, is there sort of an ethos in ancient Zen in China that is 
similar to 20th century American receptions of Zen? Or were Americans, were we just taking our own shit and projecting it onto Zen and conveniently finding a canvas half painted on which to finish the painting with our American vision? Well, it, it, it's true. Um, I visited just about every Zen monastery that existed during the Tang Dynasty or Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And what characterizes the, these early Zen monasteries is they were ecologically aware of a certain niche. Mm -hmm. We would call that niche the High Mountain Basin. Mm -hmm. pre pre previous to this, Buddhists who came from India to, to China, and then the, the early centuries, the, the Chinese who became monks and nuns, they lived in cities, mm -hmm. or they lived at the bottom of a mountain. Okay. And occasionally some, some would become hermits and live, you know, maybe at the tops of mountains. But the, the fourth patriarch of Zen mm -hmm. consciously chose a high mountain basin. Mm -hmm. uh, when Bodhidharma brought Zen to China, he had a handful, he developed a handful of, of disciples. And his successor, the second patriarch, Hui Ke, also had a handful of disciples. We only know of a couple names. Mm -hmm. The third patriarch had one disciple, the fourth patriarch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The fourth patriarch had 500. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. His successor, the fifth patriarch, had 1,000. Mm -hmm. His successor, the sixth patriarch, had 3,000. Mm -hmm. What happened is, is the discovery of the high mountain basin and the willingness to break the precepts okay. by farming. I see. Um, Monks were forbidden uh, by, from farming. Mm -hmm. You begged for your food. You mm -hmm. didn't produce your own. Right. So he was a, a revolutionary. He said, let's po support ourselves. Yeah. Um, and because this, when, when you're begging, you're, you're dependent on living close to other people because you have to go into the village every day to, 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 to get your food. Mm -hmm. So it was with, when that began, um, communities developed in the mountains where everybody was doing the same thing. Uh -huh. They were all bent on becoming Buddhas. Mm -hmm. And so up to that point when people practiced uh, Zen, it was simply, the word Zen just means meditation. Mm -hmm. It was from Zena. Yeah. And the Tang Dynasty pronunciation was Zena with a little D at the sound at the beginning. Okay. Zena. 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 And so later, later, later it was short. Sort of Zen. The Japanese picked up that pronunciation, took it to uh, to Japan. Mm -hmm. The Chinese eventually changed that pronunciation in the Qing Dynasty to Chan. But mm. anyway, um, the, this, these Zen communities living in the mountains um, made their daily life their practice, mm -hmm. not just the meditation cushion, washing dishes Zen, mm -hmm. you know, working in the fields Zen. And like I say, supporting each other with the, with their work. Of course, every every monastery has a hierarchical structure too. Mm -hmm. uh, senior monks and and uh, monks who were in charge of meditation or the guest hall. And that's another thing. They invented uh, the guest hall. Okay. Uh, oh. It was an organ a, a a place in a monastery where you could just show up, mm -hmm. and you were allowed. You could stay there for three nights. I see. Yeah. And. Uh, and of course, they would check your credentials. They would ask you some questions, uh, so you could stay those three nights. I once went up to this uh, 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 Jinru Se Zenru Temple up on Jinju Shan, where Empty Cloud's old temple mm -hmm. in Jiangxi Province, and and I wanted to spend the night, and they wouldn't let me spend the night. And finally, on the way out, I said, because oh, I couldn't prove. You say you're a Buddhist. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know the B Buddhist words, but how do we know you're a Buddhist? <laughs> So what I had to do was roll up my sleeve and show them, show them my scars oh, okay. from, yeah. from the incense I burned down on my my arm when yeah. I took the precept, precept. So whenever did you, this work? Yeah. He said, work? I said, oh, yeah, well, we're welcome. <laughs> okay. so, so when you do go to a Zen monastery to, for those three nights, you have to indicate in some form yeah. that you're a genuine seeker of the, of the, uh, on the path. Mm -hmm. But if they let you stay longer than three, three nights, then they're responsible for you for the rest of your life. Oh, that's the attitude. Okay. Unless you break the rules, and then of course they kick you out. Yeah. So it's, it's a big thing to accept somebody. But but the fact that you could go to any monastery in China and and have free food and lodg lodging meant you could go look for a teacher. Mm -hmm. Because it, if you're looking for a teacher, not every teacher works for everybody. Mm. 
And so that, that was another aspect that Zen, Zen developed was the, uh, the institution of the guest hall. And so there's always somebody in charge of the guest hall and of course somebody in charge of the kitchen, somebody in charge of the fields. You know, there, there was about a dozen different offices uh, and the positions were changed every new year. Okay. Um, so you'd go from one office to another if you were, if you were one of the, the senior staff um, anyway, that was what made Zen so powerful. Uh, they produced a better trained monk mm -hmm. and a monk that was focused more on life as the practice and not just for an hour or two a day uh, practicing and then s screwing around the rest of the day. Okay. So. So uh, when they started leaving those monasteries, they would just show up. You know, they would be part of, of of the wandering priesthood, and they they would often be asked asked to be, become an abbot mm -hmm. of a of a new monastery. Okay. So, so so Zen be, Zen's success was in a sense Darwinian. It outpopulated and produced a better trained monk than the other sects of Buddhism during the Tang and Song. Um, I I kind of feel like I'm. Some, and it's something I always struggle with reading about Zen and then also encountering it having visited temples in China and encountering practitioners, uh, both lay practitioners uh, and, and uh, monastic practitioners in China and Taiwan. Is There's this, you know, like the Zen that appealed to Kerouac seems to have been this really crazy wild man Zen. And I don't think, you know, he just, he clearly didn't make it up because just last week I was translating the story of this monk, I don't know if you know, Pu Hua who was a, a, a friend or maybe disciple of Lin Ji. And he, he became the uh, sort of tutelary founder of a Japanese sect of wandering sort of samurai monks. But apparently they didn't have any real connection to him that historically can be proven. And, and this guy Pu Hua had never actually founded a, a, his, own, his own lineage that anybody knows of. But he is, he is recorded in some Song Dynasty texts and he sounds to be totally wild. Like he would wander around wherever he went, just banging on a big bell. And it was, it was kind of a, a naughty wild man. And he's the, the story that shows up in, um, uh, I think it's Transmission of the Lamp and another text, he's, he's wandering around with Linji and he's begging people on the street to give him a certain type of robe. And people make him offerings of different garments, but he rejects them all, uh, doesn't want them. And then Linji gets exasperated and has somebody give him a coffin and, instead of the robes. And Linji says, ha ha, I got you. I got you the robes. And then he receives it and he wanders down the street dragging this big coffin behind him, yelling to everybody who, and banging on his bell, look, Linji gave me some robes. I'm going to take my robes outside of the East Gate and die in them. So everybody runs out to see what he's going to do. And he gets there and he says, oh, the feng shui is not very good here. I'll die tomorrow by, with, at the West Gate or something like that. And he goes the next day. Everybody goes, okay, this Zen monkey's, you know, I guess they're expecting he's going to die sitting up. And he's like, ah, you know what? This is not an auspicious day. I'll die tomorrow by the South Gate. Of course, nobody goes on the third day. And who knows what he does alone there. And on the fourth day, he drags it to the North Gate. And he's like, well, I'm actually really going to die here. And in one of the versions of the story, he actually has someone hammer him in. Um, and then it's hard to tell. One version of the story is very mystic. He... He, he dies in the coffin and then people all finally, well, he really went and did it and they have somebody pull the coffin that's nailed shut back open and he's not in there, but the sound of his belt disappears into the heavens. Uh -huh. but the other one is he just was never nailed in in the first place and then he just wandered off into the woods and no one ever knew what happened to him and the sound of his belt faded away into the distance, but there's no sort of implied, you know, he vaporized or anything. But I guess the, my whole point of bringing this up is it's like, there seems to be so much discipline and organization and rules that allowed Zen to establish itself, establish these communities, as you say, produce a better monk. Um, and at the same time, it's also got room for these madmen. And how, how did that come to be? And how do you have this thing that on the one hand is just ex extreme discipline and people meditating for 16 hours a day? And they, you know, we can look at photos of empty cloud, Xu Yun, read about his life. I mean, this man is just clearly discipline embodied. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have these wacky, totally like doing whatever the hell they want. And then very much appealing to like 
you know, Jack Kerouac is just getting as drunk as he wants and popping benzos. Yeah. And how, how did that? How do these two things coexist? Well, it's like you, the fact that you've raised this issue demonstrates our attitude towards Zen. Mm -hmm. That the colorful is what we're interested in. Mm -hmm. It catches our attention. Yeah. And so as Zen say comes to America, uh, what had given the roots never has existed. Hmm. There are no Zen communities yeah. so, as such. You, you get some Zen temples, uh, uh, there, and there, there, there's a, half a dozen of them in, in America. But, but the basis of Zen was a, a, a community of people living and practicing together over a period of time, and, and of course, not, and not doing it alone. And they have a cultural, a cultural foundation. That is to say, these people were, were supported, too, by the, the Chinese people, the... Um, who saw them as as beneficial to their welfare? Mm. Their practice is good for everybody because it it, it, it raises the floor. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, and of course, um, they like their crazies too. Mm -hmm. But what we've sort of our impression of, of, of Zen or the first thing that caught our attention was, wow, this is this is wild, yeah. and this, and that's Zen. And it's, you could say it's a part of Zen, but that's the part that we've sort of zeroed in on and think if I, you know, uh, it gives me the, the, the right to act as crazy as I want to and I can just call that, that Zen. Mm -hmm. um, of course, and people have done that, of course. Yeah. But if, if you look at their biographies or ask questions about their life, you'll find out that they, uh, they burned out if to, set, to the extent that they kept practicing it at all. So mm -hmm. basically Zen is, is uh, practicing every day Mm -hmm. Doing, but and we have different personalities. The Chinese do too, and yeah. they've always produced nuts, mm -hmm. and we'll always produce nuts. Right, right. But they only you only notice them when they're in a social context, mm. um, and so uh, Zen in, in the Chinese context has always been uh, communal, mm -hmm. and that was the biggest problem with the Cultural Revolution, is the loss of the lands. I see. And uh, when I met these 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 Zen masters in China. Um, that would be one of the questions that they would always uh, pose to people who would visit them, like monks from other other temples would visit the great master, and um, and they would often ask them, "So, have you got your lands back? Because mm -hmm. um, that's you got you, that's the basis of, of having a community. Um, because if you, if you have to beg for your food, or if you have to chant sutras for your food, right, right, which is what a lot of monasteries in China do mm -hmm. the way you, and they've had to do after the sense of cultural revolution the way you you, you get food is by doing a, a spiritual service like doing a funeral um, and so but these mountain monasteries in the Tang dynasty weren't weren't doing that they were just that spiritual communities mm -hmm. but um, anyway it's, uh, Zen uh, ha developed a uh, in a certain way in China, and it's going to develop in, in a certain way in the West. It's there's no way it can be the same. Yeah. Um, but um, having the, it, it certainly helped in China to to have a, a, a self-supporting commune. Mm. That really helped a lot. And that's been one of the the, the difficulties, and 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 of course, the fact that uh, these were monks. They were part of this community, and it's really hard for Americans to become monks or nuns um, because it takes a a, a break with yeah. the, with with their, their social order and um, a commitment to uh, a set of rules too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not easy, but it's it you know Buddhism is making a transition and in, into the West. And, there's no way of knowing uh, how it's going to become, and there's no way of, of saying what's good and what's bad. Mm -hmm. um, so it's up to each individual to see how, how it can work for them. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're, uh, me and some people in where I live in Port Townsend have been uh, uh, working to set up a commun community meditation hall, for example. Yeah, I visited uh, the, all right, the all building. Right. A few uh, years ago, I don't think it was ready at the time, though. No, we, well, there was a building and uh, there's a, a 500 acre fort uh, in outside of Port Townsend yeah. that the government had some abandoned buildings mm -hmm. in, and we tried to take one over to turn into a community meditation hall. 
Um, and our idea was a, a meditation hall for everybody. There's, yeah. there's no religious uh, a, a attachment to mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wear robes or know a handshake or com even give any money. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the State Parks Commission turned us down. Oh, okay. okay. So last year we went off and, and bought, our, uh, bought a piece of land in town. I see. Just a piece of about a half an acre. I think it was 200 by 100. And we've hired a, a man to design a meditation hall for us. That'll be, uh, be maybe a, a little ostentatious in a way. <laughs> um, his name is James Terrell. Um, he's known more or less for his sky spaces and that, but okay. but uh, one of the members of, of our group who was establishing this meditation hall was a sculptor who d offered to make us a bronze bell, a 300 pound bronze bell wow. that he designed. And it turns out his college roommate was this guy, uh, this artist named James Terrell. So so we've got a designer now and we're raising money mm -hmm. to, to open up a hall. So that, that's our, sort of our idea of how we can we can do something to uh, to help uh, uh, engage in this transmission of of, mm -hmm. of Buddhism or any of just the spiritual traditions of of, of any place into modern life mm. by encouraging people to meditate. Yeah. So we're basically going to have a sign over the door: uh, "Come in, sit down, and shut up." And, <laughs> And, and just breathe yeah, and, yeah. And, and practice your own your own tradition and we'll have people who teach uh, different tra just mm -hmm. different traditions but but I think the, the the one way that any of these traditions will work is if people are interested in their own life because mm -hmm. not many people are they think their life is about their their bank account yeah and their social relationships mm -hmm. and their status mm -hmm. and that's who they are mm -hmm. uh, and people don't even know they have a mind hmm. and sit down with their mind. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to try to to do something like that to mm -hmm. make people realize that this life is worth living and you have a mind and and it's fascinating. Yeah. And you could do something with that. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to It's going to be exciting to see. It's uh... Well, well, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what other people do in in their own communities and mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. help Raise the floor. That's our idea. Is see, raising yeah. the floor. Yeah. We don't care about the ceiling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we're gonna have a hole actually in our ceiling. <laughs> I like that because that's what James Terrell does. He does puts holes in the ceiling. Okay. Is it gonna have glass on it or yeah, just the... they'll put a yeah they'll something that covers it during the uh, rains. Yeah, it rains quite a bit there. Um, so I'm I'm curious. Uh, you were talking about and this shows up a lot in Zen Baggage, which is obviously written quite a few years before Xi Jinping took power, and there's been a lot of clawing back of religious, I mean, it's quite a vibrant moment of religious expansion in China under Hu Jintao, and especially I know Christianity has, and, and Catholicism have been affected maybe the most. Islam, obviously, as well. Uh, Taoist temples have been knocked down. Um, and I'm wondering if, to your knowledge, the, because you write a lot about all the work and you just mentioned it, that these abbots are doing to get land back that had disappeared uh, during the Cultural Revolution that previously allowed the temples to be self, self-sustaining agricultural communities. Has that, has Xi Jinping's uh, how to, ambivalence towards religion sort of uh, ended up becoming an obstacle to Zen, to your knowledge? Well, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, certainly there have been numerous new restrictions on on practices that were uh, becoming popularized uh, mm -hmm. back in the 90s and the aughts yeah. uh, and even the teens mm -hmm. that no longer exist uh, uh, to have a a tea shop where you where people could get together and 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 listen to somebody uh, expound on a sutra is no longer allowed. I've had, wow. I've, I, yeah, there's a, teaching in, in a public setting is not allowed. Wow. If you, if the only place you can teach Buddhism is inside a monastery, mm -hmm. um, that's allowed. Yeah. But but not in a in sort of the the religion religion spreading in in a public 
area. That's what the government is cracking down on in yeah, China. And, um, and frankly, they... Um, the government sees Buddhism as a problem. It does. Yeah, not Tao. Okay. Well, I mean, they, they should see Taoism as a problem, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, because all the revolutions in right, Chinese... Right, Taoists are always have, a part uh, of that. Yeah, they're always part of the revolutions, yeah, yeah. And, but, and the Buddhists aren't. But the, no, the, the reason they see the Buddhists as a problem is because of the huge amount of money that is being transferred to them. Yeah. This, this, I tell people the second thing a Chinese person does mm -hmm. when they become wealthy is they wire it to the next life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as much as they can. And the Buddhist temples have the routing code. Okay, <laughs> right. And so do Taoist temples. Yes, yes. They all but have, not as good. Taoists, no, Taoists, Taoists yeah. is interesting. They just never quite seem to make nearly as much money as Buddhists. No, they, of course they don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's because they're not as organized. They are not organized uh, the, at the all. The no. Buddhists are, have, have the, a, sort of a communal attitude. Yeah. Whereas the Taoists are, are usually master disciple uh, lineage is, mm -hmm. is so much more important. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I, China is certainly, the religious practice is, is, is being monitored uh, and, and restricted mm -hmm. in, in many ways by what's going on uh, at, the, at the top leadership. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, the law and order. So, I mean, uh, Zen Baggage starts out with you meeting in Beijing the publisher, I believe, of, uh, is the magazine just called, it's the magazine just called Chan. Yeah. And then it's about, you know, Shenghua Chan, like, I guess, yes. everyday life. Yes. It has, have magazines like that been shut down or? I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I haven't been in touch with Ming Yao and Ming, his wife is Ming Jie. Mm -hmm. It was Ming Jie who translated Road to Heaven. Ah, okay. And, okay. and into Kung Lu Yolan. It feels like that would even be a difficult publication to get out in well, the current environment. Well, it's working on its second million copies now. Oh, okay. It's Congo Yolan has sold over a million copies well, in China. Congratulations. Okay. Um, but for example, uh, my the same publisher uh, translated and published my commentaries on the Platform Sutra mm -hmm. and the Heart Sutra, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were forced to cease publication. I see. Because I. I'm not a monk, and I don't. I shouldn't be preaching Buddhism because monks are under the thumb of the government. Right. You know the the four yeah the the yeah. Buddhist association mm -hmm. or the Taoist association, and they can't publish anything unless the government looks at it first. Right. And yet here I was not only a monk, but I was publishing stuff that they hadn't preview. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, looked at to check if there are any problems with it. Right, right. Of course, my, you know, when, when you publish something in China, uh, the publishers are very careful of what they publish. Yes. And mine, mine, of course, were. But, uh, the, but the fact that they said you can't publish the Heart Sutra commentaries and the Platform Sutras commentary was a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, because they're, they had almost no impact in, any, in, in, in China just as they haven't had much impact in, in America mm -hmm, either. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's where they are now, and making up rules and getting everybody, you know, in a, uh, lined up in terms of, of uh, you can't you can't talk, you can't write, and you know, in a public forum mm -hmm. unless unless somebody is, is uh, in charge of your words right. or, or check them out beforehand. And um, anyway, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the complexities of, of the Chinese life are, are being organized in such a limited fashion. Because mm -hmm. the nice thing about the Chinese is, is they can explode in any direction. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're very creative people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, But now that's, that's being very carefully monitored, their creativity. Yeah. Um, shifting tack away from that entirely, but uh, another tension that exists in Zen in China that I'm, I'm very curious to get your thoughts on. And it, it shows up a little tiny bit indirectly in Zen baggage. Um, and, and I just talked about, you know, what, what do you call Shenghua Chan in English? Is that daily life Zen? Yeah, or? everyday Zen. Everyday, right, okay, everyday Zen. So, and, and, and the way you describe, and you just mentioned it now, you know, that 
Zen went from being, or dhyana, you know, of, oh, I might meditate for two hours a day and then I get back to doing what I'm doing. And you, right. you kind of talk about like warrior elite ways of practicing Buddhism. And then it became something that was through this communal living, through having land, through having agricultural activities and communities, it, be, it, it became everything in life. But at the same time, there's something extremely down to earth in that, where it's like washing the dishes is chan, and it's just that, right? And and so it seems to, especially with Mahayana scriptures, I think they can get pretty out there. And I've I've spent time at like a, a, a Geluk temple in New Zealand where the Geshe would speak, and he was a phenomenal, wonderful guy and very highly educated. But you know, sometimes he would speak to us about in quite literal terms, like he wasn't speaking symbolically about, you know, if, if you practice Mahayana Buddhism well enough, you know, you might end up one day being literally able to fly. And then would tell us these anecdotes from ancient ancient Indian history where like a like a, a Hindu pundit and a Vajrayana master got in an argument and it eventually got resolved by them flying into the sky to see who could fly better. And it literally ends with the Hindu was really good at flying. He had great powers, but he wasn't quite wise enough to understand if you left the atmosphere and ended up in the vacuum of space, you would freeze to death and explode. So the compassionate Buddhism, ch compassionate Buddhist master chased after him and said, hey, my wisdom tells me that if you get out of the blue into the black, you're gonna freeze to death and die out there. So you should probably stop. But this haughty Hindu refused to listen. And so he flew all the way into space and he died. And the Vajrayana master kind of shook his head and said, well, I guess I win the debate. And, you know, I'm sitting there as like a 24-year-old, like, what? This is like, you know, an anime plot. Well, yeah, well, you could just look at them as a, a parable. But you, i got to be honest, and I'm sure you've met people like this too. Of course. Not everyone takes it as a parable. Right. And and so I, one thing I love about Zen is it's like, just do, your, do the fucking dishes. Yeah. And really do them. But at the same time, one can't deny that there also exists in Zen this thread and and it ends up with some of the stories about empty cloud that show up at the end of zen baggage and and, and i'm not trying to put this on your shoulders i mean the things i've heard and i've read Z empty clouds biography but just the, the stories that people tell about zen masters in in taiwan and in china and they they are no less fantastical than the story of the the hindu and the vajrayana master flying into the sky and and I find that, to be honest, among practitioners, practitioners I know, it can become a kind of pressure. Like, for example, a lot of my Chinese friends in the, in, in the aughts and the early teens before I left China were extremely enthusiastic about Nan Huaijin. And for them, with, as Nan Huaijin fans, and they knew him, they would study with him at Taihu Da Jietang, and they would read his books. It wasn't so much about magic powers, but more about other things like how long can you sit in full lotus? Can you sit in full lotus for four hours? If you can't, then you, you know, your, your chi isn't good, your, your meridians aren't open, and you're a terrible practitioner. And, and I'd, at the other end of the spectrum, I would also meet Chinese people who would, you know, they'd be like, well, here, foreigner, you're interested in Buddhism. Let me tell you about Chan, Zen. It's just doing whatever you want, but at the right time. And you know, sometimes if I really pressed people on it, it could descend into like, well, you know, like being a total jerk could also be Chan if you, you know, if you feel like it. Um, and so, for me, it's sometimes been very hard to resolve this. Like, on on, it's almost like on one shoulder I've got these people telling me like, you need to look at Empty Cloud and people like him and set them as an example of a successful practitioner, and he's essentially Superman. And on the other hand, people who are like. Chan is whatever, man. Yes. Uh, and h how how do you look at this? Uh, well, the, the empty cloud can't die for you. Yeah. Um, you have to die. Mm -hmm. So it has to be your death, which yeah. means it has to be your life. Yeah. And uh, he, the path he chose is his path. Mm. You have to... You can only do what you're capable of doing, but um, naturally we can make uh, resolutions to you know, to do without a certain amount of food and endure certain hardships, mm -hmm. and um, and maybe that can be beneficial to your practice somehow, mm -hmm. but maybe not. Mm. Again, it's it, it has to be an individual practice, but um, 
Do you um, think there are markers the way that, for example, and I don't want to put this on Nan Huajin's shoulders, but I will put it on the shoulders of many people I knew in Shanghai who were big fans of his, where it's like, your full lotus isn't good. Well, then that's not, you're not practicing Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like that's not. It's, there's how, not, not much compassion in that. No. Uh, you know, that, that's, the, the, to criticize somebody's practice, unless you really think, are capable of, of teaching through that criticism mm. and just just to denigrate somebody um, anyway never appealed to me but uh, mm -hmm. yeah I don't know it's hard to criticize people uh, um, and then you never know the full story sometime of, mm -hmm. of it but that's 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 why I I, I wouldn't want to be a teacher okay because the, 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 that does mean that you you're responsible for bringing someone along mm. uh, on the path, and um, and maybe some criticism at a certain time might be helpful. But uh, that's certainly not something I I would ever want to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Nao Jin is just um, I liked him a lot, mm -hmm. but um, he was always making fun of me. Oh, okay. He said, "Yo, know, every time I see oh." You're speaking that Tai that Taiwan Chinese again. <laughs> Every time, the last time I was with him in Shanghai this before, was, uh, actually, actually at the end of Zen Baggage, uh -huh. I interrupted the the, yeah, uh, yeah. the writing to to go have dinner with him and 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 um, some of his disciples, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a five hour dinner. Mm -hmm. He smoked two packs of cigarettes, <laughs> and drank an awful lot of Mao Tai Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean. I mean it's one thing to 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 encourage people to meditate and and ask someone to pers be, do more meditation. It's quite another to be smoking and drinking, and and talking uh, about money. Mm -hmm. um, we spent five hours talking about they were going to corner he and some other people. They were going to corner the Mao Tai market. Um, oh, you know, I I would know who was at that dinner with you. A fellow last surname Lai from Guizhou was probably there, who was uh, one oh. of my Chinese medicine teachers oh, in Shanghai. Right. Long, he had a long, interesting life story. And, uh -huh. and, yeah. and, and, and the, I forget who, her name, the, his first foreign disciple, the French woman who's at the Sorbonne, who was the, the teacher of Daniela Campo, Campo who, oh, okay. who, 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 uh, who, who wrote the biography of, of Empty Cloud. Yeah. She was also there at that, at that, that, that dinner. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say, uh, it's, I, I don't like to talk about people, because, like, when Na Hui Jin, because he's done so much to promote practice yeah. in, in China. And he's, you know, very, very uh, wonderful writer. Mm -hmm. And um, let's move on to something else. Well, let, let, rather than focusing it on any individuals, I guess I would, you know, I, I think maybe a lot of, Westerners, and even me being uh, having the advantage of being in Asia and speaking Chinese, it, we're, this is not the Tang Dynasty or the Song Dynasty. Like, highly qualified Zen masters are not that common. Um, and with what I sort of just mentioned, these two extremes between, you know, Empty Cloud, there's a story of him that he's in a temple and he's going to get bombed by a Japanese fighter jet so he's able to remove his spirit and go into the you know airplane and prevent it from bombing this place where all these people are taking refuge by crashing the plane while he's sitting in samadhi as the one end where being a, a successful zen practitioner is magic it, you know magic powers it's it's harry potter or the other end is you know guys i would meet in the park in beijing who are chain smoking and hawking loogies and you know, criticizing me because I'm not having, I'm not more licentious than I already am, and I'm not even that good of a boy. Uh, how do we, in this age where oftentimes we are kind of our own teacher because we're going off of podcasts and books and translations and maybe the odd retreat, but not necessarily having the good fortune of having a master disciple relationship that can stretch over years with somebody who's got profound wisdom. Do you have any advice for yourself from, from having been on this path for several decades and encountered many people? Like, how do we... 
well, gauge you're, if we're making Well, you're progress. right. Your, your first statement is, we, we have to become our own teacher. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll need, we need people to point us, help us out at certain stages. But, yeah. But ultimately, we, we, we become the teaching. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and we we have to. It's just nobody. Like I said, nobody can die for you. Yeah. Uh, it, it it it's your life. Mm. Uh, um, uh, thank God that we, uh, we never die, and therefore we're never born. <laughs> and so we can get a lot of lifetimes ahead of us to, oh, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to 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 do this. But anyway, yeah, it's it, it's better not to listen too much to people. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless unless there's somebody you really sense is a, is a teacher, mm -hmm. and 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 a teacher for you. Yeah. Because a teacher for somebody else may not be a teacher for you. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the guest hall concept, mm -hmm. trying to find your teacher. Yeah. Um, and we get so much information, um, just words, but but often behind those words is an asshole. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's not the teaching of a of of, of a Zen master. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody can put some words together and throw them out there, uh, we don't have to listen to them. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, just be your own teacher mm -hmm. the best you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, it's been almost an hour. I don't want to keep this going forever. I would like well, to maybe ask maybe one more question yeah, about sure. poetry, if I could. And yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, I mean. Well, listeners won't know this. I, I mean, I love the Chinese language. I work as a translator. I read and translate classical Chinese all the time, and I've been very moved by Chinese prose and Chinese essays. But I've always found poetry, and I wrote about this in an email with you to you once, maybe two years ago, that the first time I really felt moved by a line of poetry, Chinese classical poetry, was something Tao Yanming wrote about where... It's just one line where he describes watching uh, geese migrating south in the autumn. And, you know, I was, I was reading it for a class, trying to finish my semester term paper in my master's program. And I was just combing through these poems very much as, you know, as a machine to prepare for this paper. But that line just hit me and it brought tears to my eyes. And then later I, I thought about, well, why did that really work for me? And I, I knew it was because I had these very strong memories of, being a little boy in the autumn in Philadelphia, it, these you know cold, damp days watching the geese fly south, and and so that poem that he wrote hundreds and hundreds of years ago, very far away from Philadelphia, plucked my heart's strings, and I can really clearly say it evoked an image from my own life. Um, but I don't have that much in common with a lot of these ancient poets, at least not on a surface level. And, 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 and I've come, speaking with friends, I've come to realize this is actually quite a common experience with, with poetry versus other forms of writing. And I was, I was listening to a podcast with a, with a Tibetan Lama who is in exile from Tibet and learned English in his adulthood, and he's now based in Seattle. And uh, he was describing the exact same thing about poetry written in English. And so my, my, I guess my question is sort of twofold. How how would you suggest that one learns to appreciate ancient Chinese poetry if one does not already have like a, a, a natural yenfen, a natural affinity with it, is my, is my first sort of half of the question. And the other half is something I've noticed in your translation work, as well as how native Chinese speakers relate to their poets is that biography is seems to be extremely important. The, and, and many of China's great poets led very interesting and oftentimes quite tragic and complex lives. And so do you think becoming familiar with the biographies of these ancient poets is key to getting to know them and therefore getting to the marrow of their poetry to the point where we are reading it with our hearts and feeling it? Inside. I think so. You do. For me, it's very important that I mm -hmm. know as much about their life that I, as I can find out because it's, it's, it, it underlies their poetry. It's their, mm. their poetry co comes from their life. They're not, they're not making this stuff up yeah. uh, just to pass an exam. Um, so, yeah, I'd say for me, their life is very important to, for their poetry. And I see little things that, that show up. Uh, I mean, let's say, I mean, there, take, there's a, 
a poem that that Talyamin writes, one of his, his where he writes uh, criticizing my sons, mm -hmm. and he has his well, it says well, he has five sons. Yeah, and he says well, you know, this one, uh, this one is is just too lazy to get married, and 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 this one, uh, you know, can't that he has twins and they can't tell six from seven. Uh -huh. They're both thirteen. Okay. And, and they can't tell six, six from seven, and, and another one is is just always chasing. Uh, the only the only thing words he knows is chasing plums and whatever. Um, well, it in my studies of of Tao Yiming, I discovered that his 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 sons must have had intellectual disabilities, hmm. because his mother's mother and his father's father were brother and sister. Okay. And this was not an, this was not uncommon in the Jin Dynasty. In fact, the emperor himself could not dress himself, wow. and, and neither could his successor. They had they were physically disabled. Yeah. So, uh, Tao Yuanming's uh, sons all eventually got married, and they, uh, have had had heirs and so forth. But that little the knowledge that behind his poem uh, helped me, you know. Choose certain words, certain way of, of of writing that poem, and just a lot of his poems uh, become so much clearer. In the sense that I I can find the better words, I can find the the right lines, mm -hmm. because I know what's what was going on in his mm -hmm. life at the time. And, and if I just took the words by themselves without any knowledge of the man, if a machine just generated those words, yeah, I I, I you know I, I wouldn't dance a very good dance. I see. I see. Um, so I think you have to know. I mean, it's it's, it's an old uh, controversy among our, among the, in the literary world, mm -hmm. the the poem as object of art. Or, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like for us Shakespeare, we don't even know, really. I, I mean, I read a great article in the Atlantic three years ago, questioning whether Shakespeare was actually a woman, and came up with quite a. It was a long and really well written and compelling, you know, argument that Shakespeare might have been this woman. And mm -hmm. I, at the end of the day, I, ha I have no idea. But what it really drove home is like we really don't know who Shakespeare is because if it's if there's enough mystery that we could still be debating, was it actually this woman? Mm -hmm. We really don't know that much. Whereas it, it's and and so it's certainly when I was exposed to Shakespeare in high school and college, we were not looking into Shakespeare's life. Compared to when I took classes in like Sudong Po's poetry and Tzu lyrics here in Taiwan, I mean, and fortunately, uh, Lin Yutang had wrote a really wonderful book, um, The Gay Genius in English, about Sudong Po, back when gay meant happy, I believe. He wasn't implying uh, Sudong Po. Sudong Po loved, loved women, for sure. Um, he might have also been gay. But anyway, like the whole thing was, he, it was this ex deep dive into the life of the man mm -hmm. in that course. In fact, we spent possibly more time discussing his biography than, than his writings themselves, which is, mm -hmm. it, it seems to be perhaps a, I don't know if you would say that that is the Chinese literary tradition that reflects generally how people do relate to their writers. Well, they do, well, especially the Chinese attitude towards poetry. Yeah, is is, is so related to the the heart. Mm -hmm. Words mm -hmm. come from the heart. Uh, the po poetry is called words from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's it, if you don't know that heart, and all you know is the words, then you know a very superficial part of the man. That's all. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I can't. I couldn't translate. Uh, I guess I could, but I, I wouldn't be satisfied with my translations if I didn't know uh, a lot about okay. the man and the period. This language, the, the word usage changes mm -hmm. and things they're referring to. Mm. Uh, I, I, that's important when I translate a line is what is he referring to? Yeah, yeah. Um, so because I because I'm 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 free when I when I translate a poem. Mm -hmm. I I don't have any rules. Okay. Um, I I just want the poem. I just want the the heart where the yeah the, the where the I always see that the original poem is not the poem on the page. Mm -hmm. The original poem is is in this person's heart, mm -hmm. and it just it comes out because they, they, that's the only way we know to get that's our only conduit to the heart. Mm -hmm. Just about is is through language. Yeah, and so um, I got I got to find that heart. 
Okay. And I'll I'll, I'll do anything to find it. Um, I, I don't have anything to protect mm -hmm. in terms of integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, people, I mean, like scholars will say, oh, you didn't translate the word green in that line because there were, it's, it said clearly, Ching Song, that's green pine. <laughs> and you only translated pine. Okay, I, okay. I mean, I mean the, the, there's a lot of, uh, that's just an example because I'd say Chinese poetry, especially classical poetry, is is fixed in, in a syllable count. Yeah. It's, uh, but if it's a seven syllable line, maybe there's only three words in that line, three characters in that line that mean anything. Mm, mm -hmm, mm. A lot of a lot of Chinese poetry is filler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to get to get that the sylla, 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 syllable count. Oh, okay. uh, so so I look at a line as it's got it's got room for for me to work with. I see. Uh, I see. To, to do something more creative in English because I'm trying to I'm trying to dance yeah and I want to have fun too right right so um, but uh, but it, it, if I couldn't know about the again go back to your original question about the biography of, of the person who wrote it I might not be even interested in reading it in the first place okay. that's what like Cold Mountain I was attracted to him mm. because of of who he was yeah so it's and and now my my most recent guy and my dance partner Tao Yan Ming too, mm -hmm. I've I've fell in love with him as soon as I heard about him and and tried to read his poetry. It's mm -hmm. taken me, it's taken me about forty years to get to the point where I I I, I felt I was ready to translate it. Wow, wow. But he's a hard he's a hard guy because his lines are so short. Mm -hmm. They're not seven char characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're they're four or five. Right. right. And so it's a very tight line, and you discover right away that in the among those five characters, that maybe there's only two characters that mean anything. Mm -hmm. He uses a lot of a lot of uh, you know empty empty words too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you don't know which ones they are. Okay. <laughs> very nice. Well, I think that's a, a really good place to stop. Mm -hmm. um, just two very small questions. When can readers expect to see your Tao Yuan Ming translations and when will uh, Dancing with the Dead, the documentary, be available? Well, the Dancing with the Be Dead book mm -hmm. will be out next April. And what, okay. what that is, it's a selection, a selection of all my poetry collect, uh, translations. Mm -hmm. um, so, so 11 different books. Um, beginning with Han Shan, actually beginning with the ox herding pictures mm -hmm. and Han and Cold Mountain, which you sent me, yeah, the ox herding and, pictures years and, ago, and 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 then um, ending with the ending with Tao Yan Ming, mm. that'll be out in, next April. Okay. The move, the film, um, will probably not be out until the fall of next year. I see. That's that's what the the filmmaker Ward Serrell, uh told me last week based upon the footage he he got in Taiwan mm -hmm. it's going to require him you know post production just yeah. takes forever yeah yeah um blending everything in what storylines he's going to choose based on the images he he collected so that'll be out in the fall and uh Tao Yan Ming will be out next winter next winter okay yeah Look next to that. next winter uh, you know cuz it will be out sooner um but publishers don't like to have books too close together. Okay. By the same person. Yeah. Sales. But it's done. I, I've, oh, it's done. Okay. I, I've finished it. I'll look forward to that. But not that it's done, done. Yeah. Because the trouble with being a translator is I'll, I'll, I'll keep screwing around with it. <laughs> yeah. it. It can always be better tomorrow. Right, right. Actually, I do have a small bonus question, but there might be no answer to this question. Did you end up meeting John Blofeld eventually? Or oh, yes. You did? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, he came to visit me in Port Towns, I mean, in, in, in Taipei. Okay. Uh, well, if you don't mind chatting for another five minutes, can I ask your impressions? He, he, he was a huge, or is a huge hero of mine. And I, I was, uh, I think his autobiography is called Wheel of Life. Yes. And then he wrote a book about Taoism. He wrote two, but one I really, really liked uh, was Secret and Sublime. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read that. And these no. Beautiful, beautiful recollections of meeting uh, various Taoists in his travels. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of people would, if you have any impressions of John Blofeld to share, would be... Well, he so, was a great help to me, encouraging me to... He, like I said, I wrote him out of the blue, out of the blue just in care of his publisher in, in England. Yeah. He was living in Bangkok, and he got the letter, and he 
encouraged me to translate Cold Mountain, all of it. Mm. And when I finally finished, he asked me, uh, he said he would write, like to write an introduction to it. And so mm -hmm. I, I went to visit him in Bangkok. Okay. And, uh, and he finished it there. And while, while, I, while I was there, uh, I spent about a week with him in his house. And he had uh, an old Thai house mm -hmm. on stilts. Wow. Uh, and and a, a good size of piece piece of property too. So it was it was not, it was in an urban setting, but on a, 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 an island in an urban setting. Mm -hmm. And he lived, lived there with his adopted Thai daughter. His, when he when he left China, uh, for for Thailand, he f resettled his wife and and children in London. Okay. Uh, but he never went back to England. Mm -hmm. uh, he spent the rest of his life in in Thailand. Uh, and he had, uh, his adopted daughter, Bom, B O M is his, his, his da daughter's name. Mm -hmm. She's still still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, his ashes were cremated and put in a, a Buddhist temple uh, outside of the city, about 20, 30 miles. Mm. Um, it was about six foot two, I'd say, mm -hmm. maybe six foot one. Mm -hmm. uh, with a shock of white hair, you know. Um, very, 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 uh, what shall I say? He didn't like to have his feet on the ground. Huh. He liked to float. And, um, soar. Mm hmm And, um, every time, uh, when I was with him, uh, um, uh, every night the, his, his, uh, his, his daughter would bring us these bottles of, of, of Thai bourbon. And we go through six or seven bottles that, but these these are bottles that are are like a maybe bigger than a Coke bottle. Okay. But anyway, we'd sit sit in, we'd sit sit there in bed and and read poems, and um, I mean just to sit with somebody who cares about stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, to get wasted. <laughs> yeah. That that was that was a, a real a fun fun moment because he wasn't uh, supercilious. He he wasn't. He didn't make any errors about himself yeah, yeah, or yeah, okay. attainments or anything like that. Yeah. He was just a happy man and, and loved loved to be happy, and especially loved to be with somebody who cared about something mm -hmm. worth caring about. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's very cool. It, it, I'm so happy I got to know him, and uh, I dedicated my 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 my, my Bodhidharma bo yeah, my bo Bodhidharma book to yeah, him. Yeah. Came out though. It came out. Uh, just after he died. I see. I see. No, yeah, no, just no, just before he just died. Before he died about died. two months after I, I sent him a copy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My friend Dan Reed was taking care of him then. And Dan Reed translated his Chinese language memoirs into English. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, Dan Reed was there when he passed away. Yeah, okay. I, I believe so. I don't know if it was the, there that day. He had been helping them because he, you know, he had cancer and. Uh, was 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 dying. Yeah. And, and I know Dan was there for that period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know whether he was there that 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 day or yeah, night. Yeah. Well. Anyway, I'm so happy I met John. Yeah. Thank you very much. We all need to that. meet a couple people in our lives like that. Yeah. And. No, that, that it's just a nice little thought of him lying in bed reading poetry and slamming oh, we, some bourbon. Yeah, we were we were both propped up against the with the headboard, <laughs> and then we had a, the table with you know full of books and went. And then the 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 the, the, the bourbon and 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 and, the, and what do you call it? soda water, um, and we're just having a great old time. Every night we do that, and um, I mean, good man and good man to be with. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well. Um, I think we should definitely stop with that. And my thanks again for you joining us for this Purple Cloud podcast here. And uh, encourage everybody to buy more books, buy more Red Pine books, and uh, see the movie. Okay. Yeah. He shrugged. He said you didn't have to buy the book, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. get out of the library if you don't buy it. Yeah, just be good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. On that note, I'd like to thank both Matthias and red pine bill porter for taking the time out and bringing back the purple cloud podcast for all of those of you out there who've been missing it 
and please keep a lookout for Bill's book, Dancing with the Dead, which is an anthology of Chinese poetry. And while we're on the subject of things to look out for, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube if you don't already, and keep an eye out for our forthcoming online education platform. A lot of exciting stuff coming up on there. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.